Okay? You know, there, there was in the church at Corinth an element. That is, some people who apparently did not think highly of the Apostle Paul or did not hold his role in high regard. And so from time to time in this lesson or in this epistle, he will speak about his authority. Not the kind where he, he beats his chest saying, look at me, but just as a reminder. And so as we look at chapter 10 tonight, and it's, it's possible, we're not prophesying, but it's possible we'll, we'll get a start on chapter 11. But in both of these sections, uh, you see Paul pointing out things that you might call defending himself, defending his apostleship. Because if they didn't recognize him as a genuine apostle, what would be their attitude toward what he had to say? Meh. You know, so they wouldn't have respect for what he had to say. And so as we get into chapter 11, he will also speak about some of the matters which he had endured. Not to present his resume, so to speak, but just to let it be known that uh, he was not in this thing for the Apostle Paul. He was not in this thing for fame and fortune or notoriety. He was in it to bring glory to God and help people get ready to go to heaven. So chapters 8 and 9 were one section on, on the matter of giving, getting their contribution ready. Chapter 10, as you look at our booklet, we've got a really brief overview on page 34 of our booklet. Our warfare in the Christ. You know, the, the church is described in a number of different ways. It's pictured in the Bible as a kingdom. We think of ourselves as citizens. It's pictured as a body. Uh, we are the parts or the members. It's pictured as the house of God. We are members of that family. You're thinking about Jesus as the high priest. We are the sub-priest. But there's also this idea of the military. Paul exhorted Timothy to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Well, what chapter of the Bible and 2 Corinthians 10 is off limits in this question. What chapter of the Bible comes to mind when you think about putting on an armor so we can be prepared to fight it out with the devil? Ephesians 6, right. What the Bible calls the whole armor of God. So there's a warfare. It's not that we're going to go to the parking lot and settle this matter with our fist. It's not that we are using material bombs or instruments of, of, of weapons. What kind of warfare is it? It's a spiritual warfare. Okay? And here's the thing about this spiritual warfare. There are only two possible outcomes for each one of us. There are no ties. There are no what we sometimes call in soccer, there are no draws. You either win or you lose. Now some things in life, you win or you lose, no big deal. Could even be comical. But this is an eternal loss or an eternal victory. So that's how serious it is. So let's read a little bit about the warfare. Verse 1. Now I might Paul myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ who in presence and base are lowly among you, but being absent and bold towards you. In fact, some of them made this observation. They thought Paul was really powerful from what distance? From, yeah, from letters, from far away. They said, oh, he, he, he talks a good story when he's far away. But he's certainly, number one, he's not much to look at. And number two, he's not the best speaker in the world. And number three, he, he's not near as tough as he is from far off. And so Paul says, you know, among you it appears that I'm lowly or base. You're not talking about humility, but it's just that sense of some of them did not think highly of him. 
All right? But I beseech you, verse 2, that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Um, in Paul's first letter to the that we have called the book of 1 Corinthians, he had said, look, how do you want me to come? Do you want me to come with love or do you want me to come with a rod, a stick? He said, that's up to you. And so as we come to the latter portion of this letter at the end of chapter 12, Paul's going to say, you've got some issues that are as of yet not corrected. And he said, when I get there, if you've not repented, he said, we will deal with these matters. And so he's not saying he has something that, that other people don't have, but there shouldn't be any type of doubt about his courage or his willingness to deal with these matters in the proper way. According to some, at the end of verse 2, the message is, the thought is that he walked according to what? What would that mean? In the scriptural sense, what would it mean to walk according to the flesh? According to the world? According to the fleshly desires that one might have? Now, but on the other hand, look in verse 3. So let, let's be careful of the language. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So in verse 2, you got according to the flesh. In verse 3, you've got in the flesh and after the flesh. Somebody said, well, if he was trying to confuse me, he's 100% successful. Okay, now, I've heard that before. Has anybody heard that? In the world, but not of the world. And so, I wonder, is that just something that old-time preachers used to say? Or is there really something to that from a scriptural viewpoint? In other words, is there such a concept in the Bible being in the world, but not of the world? you got a 50-50 chance there either is or there isn't. Hold your place here. Let's turn and search together. Let's look in John 17. John 17, the whole chapter, with the exceptions of the first few words in verse 1, the whole chapter recorded prayer Jesus prayed the night before He went to the cross. And so verses 6 to 19, He's praying for His apostles and as he prays for them, he makes those observations about them. Now, we may have to sing three or four songs while I'm trying to find these. Um, all right, verse 14, I found one of them. Verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world. Okay? That's of the world. Verse 16, they are not of the world as I am not of the world. Now then I need to find a statement that says they are in the world. 12? I knew it was 12 and 11 and 27. 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name, those that thou gavest me. I have kept and none of them was lost. But the son of perdition. Is that it? In the world, okay? I was with them in the world. So they're in the world, but not of the world. In the world in what sense? Physically, this is where we live and breathe. Go back to 2 Corinthians 10, that, that first part of verse 3, though we walk in the flesh, that, that is question number one, in what sense do Christians walk in the flesh? We live in a fleshly body, that's it. We live in a fleshly body. We have a material body. Now one day we won't. And the only way to get that other kind of body is what? Exit this world. Okay, so we got this one as long as we're here. So having a fleshly, you know what? That's the way God made us. This body is suitable for this world. It's made of flesh. It has uh, physical or material needs, okay? But according to verse 3, though we're walking in the flesh, though we live in the world, we do not war after the flesh. Okay? Or as uh, 
verse 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The idea of strongholds here is, in, in, in old times, there's a castle or some type of fortress in which you literally use military operations and approaches and weapons to try to bring that thing down. Okay, so here's the idea of, of trying to bring down, pull down so they stay down. What? Well, anything that would be contrary to the gospel. Okay, so our weapons are not carnal. Look at question two. Yet our warfare is not according to the flesh. What you reckon that would mean? Just, just any thoughts? Okay, not physical but spiritual. Okay, what else? We're not motivated in, in what we do in serving the Lord. We're not motivated by fleshly desires, right? What's that passage we mentioned earlier, the armor of God? Ephesians 6. And, and why is that armor of God so important? Well, in Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10, the record says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You know, in military operations, one key element is knowing the enemy and knowing the tactics of the enemy. Being prepared in advance you know, just helps us. And so, along these lines, if we're not using carnal warfare, we're not going to employ the things that worldly people employ, okay? We're not going to make false accusations. We're not going to use hatefulness. We're not going to appeal to human authority. We're not going to attack characters. And we're not going to stoop to, may I call it, political tactics. We're just not going to do that. We're not going to get into mudslinging and character assassination. Those are pretty popular in the world. And some would even tell you if you don't employ those, you can't be successful in life, period. But we, as Christians, we're to think on a different plane, right? And we're to march to the beat of a different drum. As long as we're in the world, we'll have this physical body with its material needs, and we'll be in an environment that has material stuff going on. But our interest is fighting a, a spiritual warfare. And you know, one of the differences between Christianity and some other forms of, of religion is we don't spread Christianity by going in and, and killing people and terrorizing them and scaring them in, into becoming Christians so they don't lose their lives. We carry what kind of a sword? A spiritual sword, right? The sword of the Spirit. That's what we use as our as our instrument or our weapon, okay? And then in, in, in verse number five, we're trying to cast down imaginations. The New King James uses the word arguments. It's this matter of reasoning. And, and please don't misunderstand. The idea is not that we should not reason. Well, what did God say? Come and let us reason together, right? We're to prove or to test all things and hold fast what's good and abstain from all appearance of evil. To do that, you have to reason. Obviously, the imaginations here or the reasoning here would be those things that are contrary to the teaching of the gospel. Those things need to come down. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. You see, it's an opposition to God. Here's the goal. Bringing into captivity, when you think about captivity, what word comes to mind? Slavery, loss of freedom. But, but this captivity here is a willful captivity. True or false, Christians are bond servants of Jesus. Willing? Yes, we're willing. And so the, the idea is bringing into captivity every thought to the what? Obedience of Christ. But there's a sense in which we try to imitate Jesus, right? And the Bible language is we try to conform to the image, try to imitate his pattern. What's the statement about obedience? Hebrews 5 and verse 9, that he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that what? Obey him. 
Somebody said, well, I don't think you have to do anything. Well, we encounter problems when we think we know what we, we think. <laughs> the Bible says Jesus gives or provides salvation. What kind? Eternal salvation. For those that do what? Obey Him. It's not somebody's opinion. It's, it's not a debate. That's, that's just what it says. And so even once we become a... There's that sense in which we obey the gospel initially and, and our sins are forgiven, but then there is that continual obedience. That was one of the things challenging the churches of Galatia. Paul said, you did run well in the past. Your life, you were running well. Who does hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Galatians 5, 7. So, so there's that aspect of obeying the Lord that's one time, the first time, the initial obedience. And then once we obey the gospel and are baptized into the Christ, there's that continual obedience. And, and that's the point of verse number 5. Paul's desire for them and for everyone that every thought, that's complete conformity to the obedience of the Christ. That's the goal. Okay? Now, in, in this next section, there's some, I won't call it difficult reading. They're not hard words. <laughs> Maybe a little bit harder than the understanding, but let's go on. And having, in verse 6, a, a readiness to revenge or punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Simply make the choice to obey and, and things will work out. Number 7, verse 7. Do you, do you look on things after the outward appearance? If we look at matters only based on outward appearance, what, might, what trouble might we encounter with that? Hmm. Yeah, things are not always what they seem. Jesus once told a, a group of Jews who were listening and had their eye on him, he said, judge not according to outward appearance. Uh, John 7 and verse number 24. If any man trust to himself, verse 7, that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. And true or false? Christians belong to, to Jesus. Yes, it's true. So it wasn't wrong for people to say that they belong to the Christ. Paul was simply saying, if you look at yourselves in that manner, then you ought to see us in that same light. Okay? Let's look. We got a, we got a question. Of course, we got a question. Number four. Number three. How about number three? We are opposed to anything and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Okay, the knowledge of God. And of course, on the practical side of that, we can know what we ought to support, and we can know what we ought to oppose. Only when we are familiar with what? God's Word. That, that, that's, that's what we use as the, the standard for, for judgment on all those matters. There's a statement in the Old Testament. It goes something like this. I may have it reversed. But in Proverbs 17 and verse 15, the Bible says, He that justifies the wicked, that means supports and embraces and encourages those who are doing what's wrong. He that justifies the wicked and he that condemns the righteous. In other words, stand against what's right. They're both an abomination in the sight of God. And so in our lives, we do our best. We try to do our best. We don't want to support or endorse or embrace anything that's not right. At the same time, we don't want to oppose or speak against anything that God Approves. It used to be 17.15. It is. Okay, all right. We're good on that. All right. Now, question number four. Our goal for ourselves and all others is to have thoughts which lead to obedience to Christ. And the very idea, somebody put Hebrews 5.9 in there. Wow. That's a keeper. Now, uh, before we do question five and read verse eight, on question five, I don't want your answer yet, but it says, as an apostle, Paul's authority came from blank. And then what's your scripture there? Ten what? Eight. And eight. Well, you got the new and improved version. I've got one that's got 
Well, that's, that's the correct verse, okay? That's the correct verse. All right, now, verse 8. For though I should boast or could boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed that I might not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. Let's go back and look at this idea in verse number 8. True or false, Paul had some type of authority. True, True or false, that authority came from the Lord. What, what do we call that? In life, it could be in spiritual matters or some other realm, where a person in higher authority... gives authority to someone below them to carry out actions. What do we call that? Delegating authority. And I've not yet seen a version of the Bible that has the word delegate. I'm not saying there never will be. But it's that idea. Delegated authority. You know, when Jesus was on the earth, he said to all the apostles, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth be loose in heaven. Matthew 18, 18. The idea there is, whatever you say is bound, it's already been bound in heaven. And whatever you preach and declare is loose, it's already been loose. So that's delegated authority. Now, Paul came along, and he was the 14th of the 14 apostles. What about Paul's authority? Was it on equal level as the other apostles? It sure was. Hold your place right here. Look back in, in the book of 1 Corinthians. Now, just a general question. I'm not trying to trick you. But that authority was given to Paul from the Lord. Okay. What's he supposed to do with that authority? Or what's he supposed to do with that authority and what that allowed him to do? Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. And, and, and we're going to look at a specific word back in our text. The word edification. It's chapter 14. It's verse 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the what? Amen. Commandments of the Lord. I'm sorry if I didn't give you the right. It's 1 Corinthians 14, 37. So Paul says, what I'm writing to you, you should look at this message as coming from the Lord and these are the commandments of the Lord. Now, let's just make this observation. Not every piece of information we have in the Bible is a command. Does that make sense? Let me repeat that. Not every piece of information we have in the Bible is a command. I'll give you three examples in, in five seconds. In the beginning was a word and words with God and word was God. That's three facts. Any commands in there? No. But, but in, in general... God's communication to mankind is described as the commandments of the Lord. When you read the book of 1 Corinthians, 16 chapters, a pretty long book, not every statement in there is what we would call a command from God saying to humans, do this or don't do it. And yet when Paul wrote that whole message, 1 Corinthians 14, 37, he said this message is what? This commandments of the Lord. So, that authority, you come back to our text, 2 Corinthians 10, 8, that authority was given to him from the Lord. Now, in a letter he wrote to the church in Thessalonica, uh, they had some issues and uh, there needed to be some corrections. And, and when he wrote the book of 2 Thessalonians, he said, if any man Obey not our word by this epistle. Note that man have no company with him. Second Thessalonians 3.14. The point I want to make is Paul wrote with authority. And when the Lord spoke through Paul, what the Lord was giving, those were not suggestions or preferences. I got a text from a guy today and he said, which time of day would you prefer to do something? I gave him my preference. When the Lord gives instructions, it's not preferences and suggestions. Now then, according to verse 8, Paul's to use that authority for what? Edification, Edification meaning what? Edification. Building up. The spiritually strengthening of the church. And uh, 
Look over in chapter 12, and you know what? We're at that point in this book that all I got to do is just turn one page. Chapter 12, verse 12. Somebody move it. I don't know. I know it was there last time I looked. Oh, yeah, there it is. Verse 19. I just, I wanted to say verse 19. I didn't trust myself. Verse 19. Again, think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you. We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things dearly, beloved, for your what? For your edify. Again, Paul is not claiming this authority so people go around the world praising Paul. He's not saying, let's build a cathedral and call it St. Paul's Cathedral. Aye, aye, aye. But he's reminding them that he's an apostle because he was handpicked. And when the Lord spoke through him, that was the same as the Lord speaking himself. Now, this idea of authority. Uh, let, let's look at the question here and then maybe uh, we'll, we'll go on from there. Number five. As an apostle, Paul's authority came from the Lord. Absolutely. And he was to use that authority for the edification of the church. The spelling count only on Tuesday nights. Okay. So here's what I want you to know. Because you remember the, the night that Jesus was betrayed. You remember what the apostles were, what do you want to call it? Squabbling about among themselves. They had a squabble going on. Who's the greatest? Yeah. And Jesus said, look boys. He said, now in the Gentiles, they got this thing with authority. He said, but among you, it's not going to be that way. And so some people have concluded then that, well, the Lord doesn't want anyone to be in authority. And they've jumped from that to say that elders have no authority. That's a big jump. That is an unjustified jump. Uh, a blind leap. It is a blind leap. And so some people conclude then that no humans have any authority in any realm in the spiritual matters. According to chapter 10 and verse number 8, Paul shouldn't have had authority. It's the same word that Jesus used when he said, all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18. So again, it's not authority that Paul has granted to himself it's God-given authority. Okay? And you know, we see that in different aspects of life. There's God-given authority in the home. Yeah? God-given authority for government rulers. And God-given authority in the church. When the apostles were alive, they were a voice of authority. When there were prophets alive, they were a voice of authority. Now then we have the scriptures and congregations have shepherds who play that role. Uh, in, in that role of authority. Okay? Now, so, Paul, verse 10, so I'm not trying to terrorize you with the letters. For his letters, verse 10, for his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is what? Contemptible. They said, well, he can write a mean letter. Uh, let's look at the, those descriptions there on question number six. Some in the church apparently did not think much of Paul and his authority. What were some saying about him? It said his letters were what? Weighty and powerful. And I think we understand they're not saying the material in which he wrote weighed a lot. Okay. What about his bodily presence? Weak. And his speech, contemptible. I had a little note to myself about that contemptible thing. Where did it go? Well, I get this note in the margin of my Bible that uh, that same Greek word is used. You remember Jesus told a parable of uh, two men went down to the temple to pray. There was a Pharisee and a, and a tax collector. Well, right before that, the reason he told the parable was there were some, some of the Pharisees trusted themselves and despised others. That word despise in that text in Luke 18, 9 is the same word here as contemptible. His speech is despicable. Now, not that his speech was off-colored or, or crude, just 
He, he's nothing to listen to. Okay. Well, he never claimed. You know, the power is not in the speaking ability of, of a person. You agree with that? Now, now, there's a sense in which a person's ability to string words together uh, in, in a public fashion may be helpful in keeping someone into the lesson. But the power is not in the message. And Paul said, you know, we didn't come with words of wisdom or, or words of sophistry. And, you know, I think in my life, the gospel preachers I've heard who, you know, some of them, you know, they're just not, they're not what, they wouldn't be in the top ten of the best speakers in the world. But knowing them as a person and knowing their message is fantastic, you know. And, and you know, each of us has a, has a role we can play, whether it's in private or public or whatever. Now, let's go on, verse 11. Let such a one think this, that such as we are in word by letters when we're absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. What's the point? It's going to be the same. Look at question seven. What did Paul assure them would be the case concerning his letters and how he would carry himself when he was with them? Whatever he's like from a distance, that's what he'll be like in person. That, that I would not doubt that. I would not doubt that. Luke 18. You mean the, the despised one? Luke 18, 9, if I'm not mistaken, Kim. Right before the parable. Luke 18, 9, they, they, they trust themselves and despised others. You know, on, on Paul's part, look, if you, just in practical terms, if you and someone get off on the wrong foot, okay? If you and someone in or out of the church get off on the wrong foot, um, it's going to take some effort to uh, make that thing better, okay? Uh, or, or first impressions. You only get one chance to make a first impression, <laughs> okay? If the first impression is, it is, doesn't come across well or whatever, then it's going to take some effort to uh, to improve that situation. Uh, if somebody didn't like Paul as a person, that's going to take what on his part? Well, he can't compromise the gospel just to make people like him. His goal was not to make people like him. But it would take on his part a concentrated effort to continue to be a good example, to show the right spirit and teach the truth. And hopefully in time, they would get past that thing of not liking him as a person. Um, sometimes you might know from experience or, or observing the scriptures, sometimes the reason people don't like the messenger is because of what? Because of the message. Uh, so one such fellow was Jezebel's husband, Ahab. There was this time when uh, Ahab was wanting to go fight against the Syrians. And he said, Jehoshaphat, you come on, come with me. Let's, let's join up. And Jehoshaphat, he had a, he had a lapse in good judgment. Anyway, he said, we got any prophets? And all these false prophets came along and they said, go up. And Jehoshaphat said, well, isn't there one more? You got any more prophets? And Ahab said, well, there's one fellow named Micaiah, but I hate him. Because he always prophesies bad things about me. You didn't like him because of the message. Uh, never should we have the intentions, I'm going to say something just so he won't like me. I'm going to say something just so she will get mad as an old way of him. That's not our motive. But when people don't like the message, we just need to do our best and move on. All right, verse 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. How would we say that today? Somebody commends themselves. Brag about themselves. Give themselves the proverbial what? Pat on the back. Okay. Uh, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Paul said this course of action is not wise. Uh, look at our question. I want some thought from y'all, please. And uh, this is, in fact, a two-parter. Question 8, page 35. 
Why does comparing ourselves with others in the spiritual realm have the potential to be an unhealthy thing? Now pause just a moment. After we enter that phase of it, we're going to turn around and turn the page and we're going to say, okay, what about a scenario where we compare ourselves with others and that could be helpful? This is unhealthy. What could be unhealthy about Christians comparing themselves with other Christians? What, what could that produce? Jealousy. It, partiality could produce pride. It, it, how could that happen, Kevin? Okay. So, so on the one hand, y'all are. Th it sounds to me like y'all are thinking in terms of, well, I'm better than she is, so it could develop that sense of arrogance or pride. But on the other hand, someone looks at someone else's abilities and the things that they are doing and able to do, it could cause another person not to be arrogant, but to it could crush their self esteem. You know, so well, I can't ever be as good as him or her, so what's the point of even trying? It also can produce an environment where people make this false conclusion. Well, if I'm better than her, I must be in good shape. If I could go down all up and down Bates Pike, if I could even sneak into Polk County on Bates Pike, and every household along the way show you some mistake the people in that house make in their life. What would that do? How would that make me closer to the Lord? It would. I don't get closer to the Lord by comparing myself to others and say, well, at least I don't do that. That's, that's not what it is. So it can be really unhealthy. I guess the word here is we're not in competition. Okay, This is not the Olympics where there's only gold, silver, and bronze. All of us can receive the crown of life. And we're not in competition. All right, now turn the page. What in the comparing though, in what situations do you think comparing ourselves to others might have the potential to be helpful? Anything at all you could... Encouraging how? I, I think it could be. If somebody has a talent and you want to be able to do that, it will encourage you to study more, memorize more. You know, Put in the effort to get to it. Okay. Right. okay. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, sometimes, or maybe something like this, okay? It doesn't have to be exact, but something like this. Here, here's this Christian, and we say, Look, I know she is in pain every waking minute. And I know how long it takes her to get from her car, regardless how close she parks, to get into the church building. But she's here every time the doors are open. And if she can do it in those conditions, I ought to be able to do that. Okay? Okay. And so I think in that sense, compare, and sometimes we, we get going, we don't like to call it that, but we have ourselves a little pity party. And then we look around and see what somebody else is going through and say, well, you know, uh, I just need to press on. So yeah, in that sense, not comparing accomplishments or achievements, but just observing their qualities. In fact, which group of Christians was it that Paul used to try to motivate the brethren in Corinth to come across with that contribution? Churches of Macedonia. Yeah, and that was a sense of, of comparison. Paul saying basically, here's what they're doing and here's what the brethren in Corinth have done. Okay, so there's that aspect. Okay, all right. Even instead of the circumstances he found himself. Yes. And, uh, he could live in a Yeah, and you know, one of the things we'll see, Kevin, uh, especially in the next chapter, is our joy and commitment to the Lord should not be based on our 
physical environment. Right? Paul was not a happy camp. Paul was a happy camper. But not because he was always in the best physical circumstances. Right? He, he was what he was in his joy and his service because of his relationship with the Lord. Okay? I'm going to read 13 to 18. Keep up. Here we go. Verse 13. But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed us, a measure to reach even unto you. Isn't the, doesn't the New King James use the word there, sphere, instead of measure? Like the sphere of his sphere of his work, the realm of his work. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so, let me ask you this. Let, let's sit back. Why originally did Paul ever get involved in the city of Corinth doing anything? Why would he do that? Again? Yeah, he, he, was, he went there as, as a, a servant of the Lord. Why was Paul involved in the activities, in some sense involved in the church in Corinth after that church was established? But that's what the role God gave him to do. Okay? For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure as though we reached out unto you. Verse 14. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. Okay? Not boasting of things without our measure or our sphere, that is of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is what? Now, when you read this letter, do you get the feeling that Paul's given up on them? No. He's talking about them growing in their faith. That we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. To do what? To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand or another man's sphere of accomplishment. Paul tried not to what? What am I trying to say? So I don't know. Paul tried not to infringe on other people's work. Okay. In fact, there are times when Paul said, I, I in some cases, I, I, I plan to preach where Christ has not yet been named. He didn't want to infringe on other people. Now, that didn't mean Paul couldn't get along with people. In fact, the church in Corinth, Paul said in that first letter, he said, I have planted, who's next? Apollos watered. God gave the increase. Look, look, Paul is not opposed to work with other people. You read Paul's letters, he talks about this co-labor, this fellow labor, this fellow worker. And there were times when we were on preaching trips, but Paul did not want to infringe on other people's activities. Verse 17, but he that glorieth, let him glory in his earthly accomplishments. Is that what verse 17 says? No. Let him glory in whom? In the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the what? Lord. Lord commendeth. So it's not about getting the accolades and applause of people. It's about pleasing the Lord. Now let's look at a couple of questions. You got time? I didn't hear a rousing yes. But... <laughs> Number nine. Number nine. Was Paul's work with and on behalf of the church in Corinth part of the sphere of activity which God appointed for him? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. We already said that verse back in chapter 3 and verse 6 of the original letter. I planted, Apollos watered, uh, God gave the increase. And Paul even asked that question in that setting of 1 Corinthians 3. He said, who or what are Apollos and Paul? He said, we are, and we'll use the Greek word, he said, we are diakonos. What is that? Service. Deacon, a servant. Yeah. In the English Bible says minister, but it doesn't mean preacher. It means a servant. That's all we are. We're doing what we do because we're serving. What's that verse you said earlier tonight? Can you still remember, Sister Faye? We preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord and ourselves, your bond servants for Jesus' sake. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So she gets double credit. She did it twice in one night. <laughs> Number 10. Question 10. If Paul, by God's grace, God's decree, and God's authority, brought the Christ gospel to them, which he did, and now he uses authority for their edification, 
What should their outlook be toward Paul and his labors? How should they respond to what Paul had done for them? Gratitude, appreciation, respect, encourage, cooperation. You know, back in 1 Corinthians 4.15, we read, Paul said, though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you have only one, what's that next word? Father. He said, because I've begotten you through the gospel. He wasn't claiming to use the word father as a religious title, but he was the one who had gone there to teach. It's like we read that he says to Timothy, you're my son in the faith. To Titus, you're my son in the faith. Well, he was their father, so they should have had respect. Um, now, let me just, I added this in my notes today, okay? Because I've seen this. It'll, it'll just rip your heart out of your chest and just stomp on it. Sometimes there are teachers, gospel preachers, who did a wonderful work at the congregation. Or maybe they taught us the gospel. And then somewhere along the line, they go way, way away from the scriptures. We still appreciate them from the bottom of our hearts for everything they've done to help us and others get ready to go to heaven. But we must not, we must not embrace their new what? Where they are now spiritually. And I've seen congregations, they, they feel kind of like in, the, in a bind. Somebody said, let's have brother whatever come back and, and do our homecoming or do our gospel meeting. And somebody says, you know, he's teaching things that aren't right. Oh, come on. We're just so thankful. Let's show him our appreciation. Um, appreciation, yes. But if somebody goes off, they go off. Okay. And we don't embrace them in that sense. Let's not end on a downer. Let's end on an upper. Number 11. Whether you like odd numbers or not, we're ending on an odd number. When it comes to the matters of glorification and commendation, we should glory in whom? The Lord. And seek to be commended by the Lord. Uh, again, we're not looking for God to say from the sky like He did with Jesus, this is my beloved child whom I'm well pleased. We're not looking for that. But here's what we know. We take the Scriptures and we, we follow what the Scriptures say then we have that rightful confidence that the Lord is pleased. It's not something to brag about, but it's something that we ought to feel good about. Not trusting in ourselves, but trusting in the Lord's promise. You live like this, you're going to have the crown of life. One of these days, in the near future, if I'm alive, I'm going to do the sermon on the great message of James 1 and verse 12. Blessed is man that endure temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. When God makes a promise, you got to like it. You know what? It's time to get out of here, y'all. Now next week we may stay over 37 seconds, so just be prepared for that. Chapter 11 is a long one.